Hey everybody, it's Larry Berman here, live from the Masters. No, I'm just kidding. That was last year. Uh, I had the very good fortune of being a patron, uh, watching Sunday at the Masters. Anyways, I've been got one one eye glued to the uh, to the TV here, and the other one to the screens here. Um, the headlines this week um, from. CPI and PPI and this Fed speaker and ECB and Bank of Canada. Everything wraps up Friday with headlines about more risk in the Middle East. So let's dive right into the chart room and see if we learned anything this week. So started um, sort of midday, late, late morning where the headlines started to come across the tape uh, like Iran will strike Israel. Russia apparently tested an, uh, an ICBM uh, around the same time these headlines were hitting. So, you know, markets that were, I guess, um, gapped down uh, earlier in, in the morning. Um, when I woke up this morning, we were close to flat, slightly down on markets uh, from overnight levels. Obviously, yesterday we had a massive move up with the perceived to be softer PPI. So, you know, you've got this environment where geopolitical is, you know, headline risk. Why take the risk? Let's raise a little cash. Let's put some hedges on. You know, really making a big move in your portfolio around geopolitical risk is really a bad idea. Your portfolio in generally should be set up so that if something like this happens, you can take an opportunity to rebalance from something that's has less risk to if something is good value and is sold off because of some risk that you actually buy into the weakness and it's an opportunity as opposed to something where you feel you need to liquidate your portfolio. If you have that feeling that you you need to sell something because you're you're scared of the world, then you simply have the wrong portfolio for your needs and and i can't emphasize that enough you should not be trading geopolitical risk having said that geopolitical risk does add volatility to markets sometimes for days sometimes for weeks but it's rarely months or years and that's an important distinction to understand so think of the short-term volatility as something that you can take an opportunity on. So let's have a look at some of the risk indicators. Uh, obviously, U.S. Treasuries flight to safety this week under the weight of U.S. CPI blowing TLT up here a little bit. You had a, a very uh, weak three-year auction on Tuesday. You had a little bit of a, a rally on Tuesday. CPI comes out, big gap down. Bad 10-year auction, sells off to the lowest level in about six months. The 30-year auction, we had further follow-through weakness, even with the PPI coming in a bit better than expected. But Friday, headlines hit, risk off uh, markets, a bid comes into treasuries, we have a rally up, and then really goes nowhere by the end of the day. But we saw something very similar happen on Friday with other uh, risk uh, off assets. So gold. So this is the most significant reversal pattern on gold since we saw here in December where we had that fake two day, I would say fake, head fake for a couple of days and then back into the range. Um, at no time here did the base break or did technical levels break and the pattern of higher highs and higher lows is still sort of developing for gold. So I think for the most part, the structure on gold is still bullish. Having said that, if there's no military follow through uh, and this run up here is more than just Chinese central bank buying, then um, you know, we should continue the trend here. Saw some stories today about 3,000 gold. I would throw all those in, in, the, in the crapper because everybody who tells those stories 
are gold bugs and they're always telling those stories. So I would dismiss that. Technically, we're pretty close to where gold should find some resistance based on Fibonacci projections and trend lines. And we talked a little bit about that in past weeks here when we did a bit of an analysis on the gold market. So not too surprised here. Uh, I trimmed some of my gold exposure today and earlier this week into that strength. Uh, we wrote some calls on equities where we wanted to own the stock still. Um, Newmont was was one we put out uh, about a six month covered call strategy. I picked up about 8% over six months. So really nice on that. We trimmed, trimmed some GDX in some of our BMO funds where we only use ETFs in those portfolios. We cut, cut a little bit there today. Um, probably a little bit more to go. However, when these gold stocks start reporting in a couple weeks, if they really have a lot of good news in that, we're not going to capture this move up here. But if they talk about the forward based earnings, you know, starting to improve because of uh, gold prices rising, then I think you're going to see a lot of stickiness to this move in gold and gold uh, equities should respond even better than they have in recent weeks. So I really like gold here still, but short term, maybe a bit of a trading pullback. Other risk off indicator volatility, obviously big spike up again here. When the headline started hitting, you also saw Michigan come out at 10 o'clock on the consumer side and future expectations of inflation ticked higher than the market was looking for. So you, you, you got that, but then around midday, you just lost the spike in vol for the rest of the day. This move in volatility, the, the variance we're seeing in the intraday moves, this is not bullish price behavior. It's bearish price behavior. And we have not seen this in a long, long while, months and months and months um, in equity markets. So what's happening here in all the risk off indicators seems to present um, that um, the trend is broken here in equities, as you could see, trend on the S&P 500. It broke last week. Listen, it was a very steep trend line. Very often a trend line will break a little bit and then come back. If we don't come back into the range and make a new high within, say, the next week, then it isn't going to do that for a, quite a while. We're then in a correction period. Where's the correction going to go? To me, it's pretty obvious. The old high and breakout from a few months ago, around uh, 4,800 on the S&P, 4,820 to be exact. Turns out that's exactly where the 38.2% FIBO is. Uh, that's just about where the previous high was here before the breakout in early January or, or uh, yeah, mid-January. So that's where I expect the correction to come back to. The 200-day average is rising. We project that out for a month or two here. And that 4,800 area just shines out as a big magnet. March 1st, the next Fed meeting. We'll put that on the calendar here. Again, a lot of things are pointing to, to me to the 4,800 level as a corrective pullback. For the bulls out there, that's your opportunity to step in. For the people who are still more cautious on valuation, um, trim a little bit here and and uh, look for those levels to hold before you uh, you step back in. Anyways, we'll we'll update more on that as as the uh, as the uh, events you know develop. Uh, obviously, earnings season uh, started. J.P. Morgan. Uh, BlackRock, good numbers overall, didn't present a lot of, uh, you know, negative risks. Loan loss provisions weren't, you know, weren't off the charts. I would not expect any of that at all now with the economy still very much at full employment. So you're not going to hear that. But if on good news and good earnings, the stocks aren't performing, 
that also tells you there's a lot priced into the tape. Hopefully the weekend does not bear uh, something tragic uh, for the world, but uh, I fear that that, that risk is, is somewhat imminent um, and that the escalation of the war in the Middle East is, is inevitable. Um, again, not, not a forecast, but, but a, a grave concern for friends and family in Israel and, and for others um, in that part of the world that, uh, you know, uh, the stuff like this is really a, a human tragedy. Anyways, have a good uh, weekend, folks. And, uh, you know, for the golfers out there, let's go, Scotty. Scotty.